The Neoplatonic philosopher Plotinus, in describing the God content in human nature, referred to it as the good. He admitted, even with the definition, that it was not adequate, that we have no way of finding a word or a group of words that can convey the tremendous potential that is locked in the individual. He chose the term, the good, because it was simple, that it had something of the unity and gentleness of this tremendous overpower. He also pointed out that by the term good, we mean that which produces according to its own nature. Therefore, all things arising from the good must be in themselves good. And therefore, within man is a spiritual fountain of virtues. And these virtues, expressing themselves in their own proper and natural way, must in turn produce virtue in conduct and must cause man to gradually but inevitably build toward integrity in all of his conducts and in all of his achievements. Plotinus lived a long time ago, but the world which he knew has not substantially changed a great deal. Surely we have made living much more complex, and we have added a great number of inventions and commodities unknown to our ancestors. But these are of the incidentals of living, the essential of life itself, conduct toward the good, has not been changed by the passing of time. More developments, more inventions, more ingenuity, all these things give us new challenges in our search for the good. Thus, as our way of life unfolds, we can accomplish more good. We can direct our activities uh, toward the service and improvement of values and of states of man in order that this good may have a fuller opportunity to express itself on all levels of conduct and activity. Our first problem, then, is to try to understand, uh, as Plotinus explains it, uh, the relation of this good in man to the sovereign good in the world. According to him, <coughs> Plotinus, this sovereign good is what we term God. This sovereignty of good is more than a mere quality. It is a being, substance, or essence, forever operating according to its own nature. At the root of all things, therefore, is a power essentially good by nature, and therefore essentially good in all of the things which flow from it into our observation and knowledge. The sovereignty of good places the entire world under a law of benevolence. While we may obscure this law, it is available to us if we seek it. And beneath all appearances, to the contrary, the substance of good is unchanged. Thus we have two ways of life, life according to substance and life according to appearance. Life according to substance is a life of releasing through ourselves those values which ex exist forever. A life according to appearance is a life conditioned and modified by the various levels of our own understanding or misunderstanding. A life according to seeming or the acceptance of things not in themselves necessarily true, but apparently urgent. 
Thus Plotinus gives us another concept, namely that we can live according to eternity or we can live according to urgency. To live in accordance with eternity is to live with laws, to live with principles that do not change. A life according to urgency is an eternal compromise to meet the passing circumstances of the day. A life lived according to emergency creates new emergency. And we go on with no essential plan, drifting with the currents of our own conduct, constantly forced into desperate situations from which we must rescue ourselves by an occasional outburst of basic intelligence. And for most persons, the only time that we call upon intelligence is when some desperate situation has arisen. The rest of the time, we are content to live according to emergency. Today, because of the complications in our living, emergencies are more frequent. And as this condition continues, and intensifies, the need for basic intelligence becomes more obvious to us. Thus, in difficult times, we search for value. We strive in one way or another to restore the integrities by means of which we can face situations without unreasonable fear. To build a life according to the good, therefore, we have to next consider that good in relationship to ourselves, uh, to the essence of our own nature. Realizing that good is at the foundation of all existence, we must find it in connection with our own existence. Realizing that we are parts of, a, of an eternal totality, that we are units within unity, it becomes imperative to reintegrate ourselves in relation to good. Can man possess good? Essentially, he cannot possess it, but he can use it. In nature, man actually cannot possess anything. What appears to be a possession is merely something that is loaned to us, something that we have certain stewardship over for a period of time. We can possess none of the values which we need for our survival. But we can draw upon eternal values to meet our emergencies, thus not by possessing, but by sharing, not by owning, but by using the available resources of life. We gradually advance our destinies. Man cannot possess sunshine, nor rain. He cannot possess love or truth. But all of these values on their various levels are accessible to him. He can plan according to the sun and the seasons. He can live according to certain values which he shares with other creatures. And as he obeys the law's governing values, he becomes increasingly secure. In our daily papers, for example, we observe now that a heavy winter with many storms and snow, this winter is resulting in the annual phenomenon of floods. In various parts of the country, melting snows and unseasonal rains are producing the usual flooding of low areas of land. We have always had these floods. They have been part of our way of life since our beginning. And yet, for some strange reason, we have never really learned to capitalize upon nature's means of operation. Each year the floods come, a man unprepared for them uh, finds a great loss. His home is flooded away. 
his land is inundated, and he takes a serious punishment, and yet year after year he has known that these things would happen. It is the same in our internal life. We know that certain values must be fulfilled because these values are lawful. Yet so often we try to live ignoring the laws governing these principles. And when, because we have ignored, a deluge comes upon us, we are offended. We are disillusioned. We feel that nature is against us or that the gods are afflicting us. Actually, we have not learned to use. We have not learned that there is a value even in a flood if we know what to do with that flood, how to direct it, and perhaps how to store these waters for some time of drought. Because we have not conquered the problem, the problem continues to burden us. It is the same with the floods within our own lives, the floods of emotion, of impulse and instinct, which come forth from us. Unless we use these, they become a terrible force. But it is not the energy or the principle itself that is at fault. It is that man has variously ignored, betrayed, or misunderstood uh, things in themselves naturally and properly good. Thus man has an adjustment to make throughout his living. The adjustment between his own carelessness his own indolence and his own indifference, and the ever-moving laws with which he is involved. To adjust to these laws means to have energy and resource available. To disregard these laws is to be swept away by a flood of circumstances. Plotinus, then, in his discussion of the good, points out that one of man's first needs is to discover that at the root of everything that happens is good, and that whether this good shall reveal itself or be concealed, whether it shall appear to be fortunate or unfortunate, depends upon man, depends upon his own ability to meet the challenge of circumstances. We have some trouble, perhaps, trying to understand all the aspects of good as these operate in the world, for some of these operations are not easily reconciled with our desires. We find it very difficult to see good in the storm or in the earthquake or in the flood or the fire. We would so much like to be relieved of these pressures and these needs. Yet by degrees we have transformed many ancient problems into valuable assets. We have learned in many ways to make use of nature's temperament to the advancement of our own purpose. In the same way within ourselves, there are pressures. These pressures seem to lead us into trouble. These pressures appear to be uncontrollable. But actually, Conditions which are uncontrollable are merely conditions which are uncontrolled. And any part of man with which he must labor in his daily work can be controlled by the totality of man. Anything within human nature which arising within the individual can become a force in his life or operation. Such an energy is susceptible of direction. It can be channeled into its proper purpose. The moment it is so channeled, it is no longer a danger or a problem. Its value becomes immediately evident to us. Thus man has, within himself at all times, the power to integrate himself, the power to organize his resources, and the power to attain to a security of life and consciousness. It might also be asked, and Plotinus brings up this point, that persons on various levels of personal attainment, persons interested in or specializing in certain particular arts or sciences, dedicated to certain convictions or policies, 
present innumerable individual variations upon the theme of life. Can each of these persons integrate his own life as it is and where it is? Plotinus believed that he could. Plotinus was convinced that each individual can achieve the security that he needs, the integration necessary to him, without a prodigious intellectual effort. The individual does not have to completely perfect his nature in order to attain a reasonable adjustment with life. Adjustment can always be where we are now and as we are now. In each instance, adjustment is merely the proper use of a resource already available. The individual has made the subject much too difficult in his own thinking. He has envisioned a, an abstract or ultimate perfection, and until he attains this, nothing worthwhile can be accomplished. While it is true that man may dream toward a state of completeness, that this state of completeness is not to be attained merely by dreaming about it, that it must in its own course result from a series of adjustments long made and continued over vast periods of time. At any moment, however, a degree of adjustment necessary for the successful maintenance of life is possible if we really want it and if we are willing to make the necessary uh, sacrifices of less valuable things. In the beginning of the philosophy of mysticism, we then come to this concept, namely that available to the individual at every moment, at all times, and everywhere, is an energy, a power, called the good, which can be called upon, which can be used, which can be regarded as solutional to the immediate needs of the day or the hour. How then are we to make this force available to us? Plotinus gives us a simple formula, one that probably is as useful as any that we can conceive. He points out the basic need of a conviction, that the individual must possess within his nature one prerequisite, namely a sincere belief that such good exists that such good is available, that such good is capable of solving the problem of his life. This belief, this conviction, not only precedes action, but becomes the very springboard for all achievement. It is this mysterious brace upon which we can rest the fulcrum of our endeavor. If, then, we are willing to acknowledge the presence of good, if we are willing to acknowledge the reality of God as a power, a principle, or a being, the reservoir, container, and fountain of all good, if we are capable of such a conviction, and we mean it, this in itself is practically all that is necessary. Uh, for the release of at least a measure of our internal resource power. Without the basic conviction that there is good, obviously our position is weakened. If we wish to live in a universe of accidents, we must be burdened by those accidents. Education, theoretically, should take the belief in accidents out of the life of man because education is based upon values and certainties that are unchanging. Mathematics is a science of unchanging values. Art and music 
developed by laws which we have to obey. Even industry and science is in const are in constant, constant indebtedness to law. If we will penetrate the surface of lawlessness, we will find law beneath it constantly. If then what we call faith needs a foundation, that foundation is in the everyday factors of living. Faith is not the believing in something which cannot be demonstrated. Faith is not man's blind acceptance of values which he cannot see or understand. Faith is based upon man's ability to observe accurately the most commonplace incidents of living. The, the foundation of faith is not a blind believing. It is a keen, open-eyed observing. Any person who will observe will have foundations for faith. Not only do we observe things, not only do we observe persons, we also observe patterns, patterns of conduct, patterns of law operating in history. And everywhere, this pattern can be seen, can be experimented with in at least an intellectual way, and we can come to almost inevitable conclusions. Any person basically intelligent can see in history, art, music, literature, science, education, religion, philosophy, indications of the workings of laws, and can come finally to the realization that life is a legitimate unfolding of law and within law. The moment we have this concept, the moment we permit ourselves to observe our own living and the lives of others, we are led to this inevitable conclusion. Thus what appears to be faith is nothing more than the acceptance of the undeniable. But because we do not observe, because we do not wish to take the time to consider, we accept only on authority that which we could easily demonstrate for ourselves. We live in the presence of the law of gravity. We behold constantly Laws without which we could not function, could not exist, could not continue in our daily courses. Therefore, we do not have to blindly accept. We merely have to consider thoughtfully the very facts with which we are surrounded every moment of our existence. Now, one thing, as Plotinus points out, has somewhat complicated this situation. Man is a creature of imaginations. He is a creature of, of various uh, moods and emotions. And by degrees, he has complicated his concept of natural law. He has also complicated his concept of spiritual law. And out of his struggles to integrate a way of life, he has over-theologized the very simple problems of living. He has therefore taken simple truths everywhere observable, and he has organized concepts about them, creating sects and creeds and faiths and religions. And these have their own demanding allegiances. So by degrees, the individual searching for a pattern upon which to build his life comes into contact with patterns which are not entirely lawful, not entirely built upon simple and obvious facts, but upon a confusion of these things. Gradually, things which are not of the essence have been elevated above things which are essential. And today, the individual, in order to gain the strength of a faith, must make a series of undemonstrable acceptances. He can accept 
the law of evolution, he can accept the simple fact that nature is a magnificent framework of mathematical formulas. And he can prove this in the course of time. But there are other things which he is now expected to believe, which he cannot prove, such as abstract theological problems concerning the relative importances of the three persons of the Trinity, or the significance of the various sacraments, and whether or not the individual can be saved without baptism. These things, in their literal meanings, become confusing. And unless the person approaches them with a degree of insight by which he can unlock symbolism and allegory, he is likely to be confused. Most of the confusions of religions are due to the various methods used by teachers to bring ideas to persons on various levels of development. Also, racial environments, time, circumstances, and the policies of ages have influenced the presentation of spiritual knowledge. The individual today is confused not by the primary factors, but by the continuous emphasis upon things which he cannot demonstrate, which he must therefore accept or reject empirically. And he recognizes that he is not able to make these decisions uh, reasonably, because in actual fact, some of these decisions cannot be made reasonably. The very problems involved representing unreasonable extensions which cannot be rationalized. Thus in the presence of what we call acceptances today, the person has difficulty in making a total choice. He has trouble trying to associate himself with one creed or another creed. Some parts of these doctrines appeal to him. He senses their integrities. Others parts, perhaps, he does not understand and is willing to permit to remain in suspension. He is willing to acknowledge their possibility. And still other parts, his own experience warns him, may not be right for him or might be unsuitable to the level of conduct on which he is functioning. Thus today, faith is no longer an acceptance of law. It is an acceptance, acceptance of dogma, of various cults and creeds and teachings, many of which man finds difficult uh, to cope with reasonably. This, however, should not discourage the really sincere person. For beneath all these different creeds and sects and dogmas, there is also the basic pattern of law. And as we go back to the sacred books, back to the teachings of the ancient prophets, back to the originals of these things, we find that their essential concepts are practically identical. That all of them began with the acceptance of a principle of good, and each em emphasized in its own way that for man, virtue is living according to this principle. And that this virtue, this path of living according to law, is the beginning and foundation of all security for the individual. Without this pattern of living, man is not safe for himself or for others. Having thus come to at least a reasonable conviction, we move inevitably toward the future, realizing that the day must come when there will be a victory of the universal plan over all of the interpretations which man has imposed upon it, that a universal religion is conceivable, in fact that it is inevitable, and man growing up will outgrow creeds and doctrines, but he cannot outgrow the laws which lie at the root of existence. 
Final religion must therefore be final acceptance of ultimate law. And in this acceptance, the development of a moral and ethical way of life, a way of life in obedience to those principles which will not change and to which man must ultimately come and acknowledge their supremacy. As it may take some time for the whole world to come to such a pattern, not as long perhaps as we think, because of the rapid development of our knowledge of the universe. As it will be some time, however, the individual may not find it necessary to wait until all others have achieved this before he too uh, can share in the concept or in the understanding. Each individual is in a position to make these decisions for himself, to discover the law the moment he is willing to turn his attention upon the law. His own family, his home, his business, all of the common things with which he is familiar are also vehicles of this law, textbooks of it, forever revealing it. If his business fails, there is somewhere in this pattern a mistake relating to law. That is, if his business is built upon a lawful concept of barter and exchange. If his personal life does not work out, there is some lack of harmony, some lack of proportion and relation, and the solution must lie in the law. Everywhere the law operates, in the life of man and in the smallest creature. In fact, it is most clearly manifest in some of the lowest kingdoms of nature, where laws operate because there is no rational individual mind to interfere with their natural motions. Having the concept of law firmly in our consciousness, we then begin to search for it and have always known and held that what we seek we are most likely to find. The reason why we have not found justice in nature is because we have sought for injustice. The reason why we do not find the good in others is because we prefer to approach other people critically and find out what is wrong with them. This forever searching for that which is not good, this forever recognizing the mistake rather than the virtue, this continuous taking of things apart, this attitude of universal criticism, which man has mistaken for intellectual maturity, is responsible for the fact that he has systematically overlooked the good in almost everything. Today, when we talk about other people, we spend one minute on their virtues and an hour on their delinquencies. We are also very apt, in the case of others, not even to express our own knowledge of what is wrong with them. We accept the criticisms of neighbors, acquaintances and associates, enemies and friends. We do not even bother to find out whether these things are true or not. We assume that they are true because they are negative. And anything that is an expression of something wrong must be truth. This is due to what we call the analytical instinct. We like to assume that maturity is this particular attainment of intellectual integration by means of which we can discover with some exactitude what is the matter with everything. We also then have the added privilege of sort of sitting in judgment from a condition of aloof virtue. In our hunting, we seldom, if ever, 
seek to find out what is wrong with us. We are too busy uh, helping to diagnose the rest of humanity. The fact that everyone else is wrong also seems to give us a certain justification for being likewise. If no one else has been able to make much of a job of living, then we should not be criticized if we do no better. It is all a kind of lazy person's escapism. Also, it is rather convenient to our own selfishness to find an illegal world. The individual who really believes that the world is honest has greater difficulty in explaining his own dishonesty. The reason why he is able, with a good hope, to live below the standard of his own ethics is because he doubts in himself that there is any ethical criterion. It is impossible for him to believe in good and act contrary to it. Therefore, if he is acting contrary to it, he does not believe it. What we actually believe, we do. And wherever there is compromise in action, there is compromise in belief. Wherever we do not keep the laws, it means that we have not accepted them as real. Now, if we remain to a certain measure ignorant, by choice, and that is perfectly possible. It is perfectly possible to cultivate an exquisite sophistication of ignorance. We can make a career out of it. We can make certain that we never have to face ourselves with facts. We can make certain that the moment someone says that there's something wrong with us, that we can scream more loudly about what is wrong with someone else. This solves nothing, but it takes the other person's mind off of us. At least we hope it will. Or it is a negative excuse to cover the fact that we've never had any real intention of living contrary to our most personal selfish motives. Now, it is not true that the average person is totally selfish. It is not true that the average person has no faith. And it is certainly not true that the average person is without some hope of a better world than the one he lives in. Most persons are interested in trying to improve society, give better opportunity for the young to grow up in a better world. There's a great deal of good-heartedness and right-mindedness in man. The great difficulty with the problem usually is that the individual is generally good-hearted and specially selfish. His generalities operate until his own personal wishes are assailed. The moment his general concepts of virtue requires some special and tedious action of his own. He discovers that his faith is not so strong as his tendency to indolence. He is perfectly able, when not involved, to judge righteously. But once he is involved, he falls back upon self-defense or self-escape. Between his basic concept, therefore, and the operation of that concept under the challenge of circumstances, there is an interval which the average person has not learned to cross. This interval is almost a subconscious barrier uh, to progress. The average person does not consciously become stubborn. He does not intentionally lock his mind. Nor can we say that of a free will and accord, he permits his emotions to run wild. 
The moment a certain level of challenge is reached, the individual finds that he has not available the resources to control himself. He passes from a voluntary management of his affairs to an involuntary one. And the moment that this involuntary process sets in, he finds that the various projects upon which he is working are injured. He is not able to manage them properly because feelings and attitudes, prejudices and conceits have taken away his judgment. The only answer that philosophy or wisdom has ever been able to give to this type of situation is the importance of the thoughtful pause, that the individual, when faced with a situation in which he finds his self-control slipping away from him, finds it also very useful to pause for a moment and reorganize his forces. If he dashes on beyond the point of control, he is likely to do things he will regret for the rest of his life. It may take a certain amount of energy to control his own conduct, but it only requires a relaxation of energy to make this pause. This pause does not require a tremendous self-conquest. It merely requires a moment of relaxation, a moment of letting go. The establishment within the life of a psychological pattern by which the individual instinctively pauses the moment he realizes that a situation is out of hand. This thoughtful pause has also in various ways been systematized by great leaders who have realized its absolute need. There were a number of the uh, great uh, military, political, social leaders of the past who surrounded themselves with machinery by means of which it was impossible for them to make hasty decisions. Today in industry, nearly all important matters are delayed. Delayed under one excuse or another. One of the most common being that the material or the problem must be presented to a board, to a group of specialists, or must be taken up at another meeting two weeks or a month from now. Perhaps the two weeks or a month means nothing. It could be settled on the moment but a thing of importance must be given a pause, a time to think it through and to determine an adequate course of action. Thus, anyone with a decision to make can ask the right to sleep over it, to give it a day or two of thought. When he contemplates going in debt, when he contemplates uh, making a purchase that may be unreasonable, uh, when he contemplates a decision which may affect his entire future, he has a right to pause and should pause and not permit himself to be over-influenced by the pressures around him which may be ulterior or at least not very enlightened. So the pause gives us this ability to reorganize, to think it through, perhaps to seek advice, perhaps to check legal situations, and that, in that way, save ourselves from a great many emergencies. Now, most persons are capable of pausing. The difficulty at this point is that once they pause, they never do anything, and we have to work with that problem. The pause becomes continuous. The pause becomes a total evasion or becomes the base of an extensive procrastination in which perhaps values are lost. But let us point this out. There are a certain number of instances arising constantly in which pause is possible. There may be an occasional circumstance in which the pause itself could be disastrous. But if the individual has learned to pause when he can, and where the situation so uh, makes it possible 
to think through each step of a situation carefully in an orderly way, he begins to integrate his own faculties. Gradually, a certain perspective develops within him, and he finds that the instinct to pause and consider and the consideration itself shortens its time patterns. It is perfectly possible to take a long, healthy pause and think a thing through reasonably well in 30 seconds. Because those 30 seconds can be very long if you are using them with the full cooperation of your own subconscious nature. In five minutes, in a dream, you can live your whole life. Practically every detail of it, because time ceases. And when faculties trained and skilled in decision are forced to operate, they can review a complete situation in almost no time at all. But before they can do this, they have to be trained. They also must be uh, shown, shown that such process is possible to them. The first decisions may take quite a little time, but gradually, the fact that we subject every problem to orderly procedure causes that orderly procedure to become automatic. And we will find the general level of decision on every problem rising with this careful attention. We know that we can make very important split-second decisions in traffic, that a good car driver can find the best of a dozen possible solutions to an emergency and do it so rapidly that he may save himself and the passengers that ride with him. In a split second, he has surveyed a dozen possibilities and chosen one. He has this capacity, but he doesn't use it. And as a result of not using his own capacity, he settles down to the long and wearisome problem of arguing with other people or trying to secure help when the help is inside of himself all the time. Always bearing these thoughts in mind, we then come down to the problem of releasing this general capacity uh, which is in ourselves, this releasing of the value, the good in us. Plotinus tells us that this good carries within it every constructive aspect of knowing or of participating in value. In this good is wisdom, love, truth, law, reality. In this good there is available to us the total solution of total living. But at no time do we call upon its totality. We merely seek to define value and principle in some decision that is immediate or in the planning of a life pattern with which we must continue through the years. This good then coming from inside locking itself with the intellectual machinery of our modern way of life, which is mostly faithless, or with a very dim and uncertain believing. This confusion must be straightened in some way. Plotinus again tells us that we have always overestimated uh, the problem of the availability of the energies and resources of solution. In other words, we have made the problem too big. It is not the problem that is big. It is our own attitude about the problem that is distorted and deformed. We do not need a superhuman, uh, incredible capacity or a prodigious exposition of our energies in order to achieve what we need. The most important of all 
aspects of the subject, is this capacity to simply permit good to exist, to function in its own way, to relax by degrees that which is not good. The individual is not asked to remove any fact from his living, nor to make a decision compromising any principle or any truth or any value. All that he is asked to consider is the possibility of recognizing the untruth of that which is obviously untrue. He is asked to question a little in himself whether something that he has tried a hundred times and has always failed is going to be any better the next time. He is asked to consider that certain courses of procedure in his own temperament have cost him friends and have interfered with his life for 30 or 40 years. Shall he continue them in stubbornness? Also that in an emergency he has always found himself lacking in some necessary attribute. Is he merely going to accept this lack and go on lacking it forever? It is just that simple. Nothing required or involved except common sense. The recognition of things which are obvious and evident not only to others but to ourselves. Against this, we have one faculty of our own nature that we do have to educate. And that is this strange internal sense of the divine right to do as we please. Most persons will never question that their desires are laws. The mere fact that we want it makes it right. The mere fact that it is our opinion makes it true. The mere fact that it is our desire makes it good. These types of thinking have got to be sublimated to a degree at least, so that we get over a curious kind of infallibility complex that has always been troublesome. How shall we get over it? The simplest way to get over it is to make a quiet investigation of what the attitude has already done to us. One of the simplest ways of getting over alcoholism, if the individual is not too far advanced in it, is to sit down and think back and found, find out what it has done to him already what it has cost him in money, in time, in the sensitive relationships of life. And he will finally discover that any bad habit is too expensive. In the same way, the infallibility complex in himself, this ruthless determination to always assume that he is right, if he will sit down and think it over, examine the facts, he will finally come to the conclusion that it is not possible for him to have been always right and at the same time be in the mess he is in. And that is uh, pretty obvious to us. Our relationships with other people cannot be right if we have lost every friend we ever had. Our relationships with our families cannot be right if we can't get along with them or have already had several broken homes. This problem of always being right and yet at the same time always being miserable can be faced. A child of ten could face it, but after the average person graduates from college, he can't face anything. <laughs> he has lost all sense of direct action. And after he has compromised with himself for the best part of a lifetime, he has no inclination to face himself because he suddenly realizes that it's going to be a rather disillusioning experience. 
The mere fact that he fears to face himself is proof of the fact that he knows what he is going to find is not good. Well, if he keeps on doing the same thing and refusing to face himself, he has no right to talk about a hard life or difficult times or how other people have injured him. He has to take stock. And the simplest way to take stock is not to immediately transform oneself from an egotist into a hopelessly repentant sinner. That does no good. Nothing is less profitable than vain regret. If we use half the energy to correct our ways that we use in regretting them, we would probably be far on the way toward peace on earth at the present time. We have to dissolve in one condition or another. We are creatures of extremes. We have to do the wrong thing with a great deal of enthusiasm or the right thing with extreme reluctance or we have not achieved anything. All of this is of no meaning. The individual has to discover that it is obvious that there are better ways of doing things. That there are other people who in the same situation are making a better job of it than we are. And it is no use to point out that there are others not doing so well. Because that constantly justifies ourselves. And that is the one thing we must avoid. Yet in majority of instances, if Someone points out a fault. We can hardly wait to point out the faults that he has. We sit on the edge of the chair just waiting to get in and tell him how much worse he is than he thinks we are. Now, by fact, if he was everything we think he is and was hopelessly deficient in every quality, this does not justify us for one mistake of our own. If he has 50 faults to our one, this does not condone ours or make it less than it is or mean that we can live any more happily with it. It's trying to get back to bedrock, to get back to facts. And all mysticism and all mystical religion is strangely locked with facts. It is not the dreamy, mysterious thing we have always thought it to be. It is a real, earnest endeavor to discover the nature of fact, realizing that fact itself is sacred, that fact is divine, and that each fact is a real, immortal expression of the divine being itself. Having thus some concept of fact and having the tendency to desire to be more factual, let us not think for a moment that a fact means materialism. Facts are not materialistic. Facts are merely mechanical or physical evidences of universal laws that are in themselves spiritual principles. But the moment we think of a spiritual principle operating reasonably and in an orderly mathematical way, we begin to think of it as something materialistic. There is nothing more materialistic than the effort to live outside of law. For it assumes that there is an interval between material ways of things and divine ways of things and that man can succeed without bridging that interval. That is true materialism. If then we begin to want to dig into ourselves a little bit to find out what resources we do have, let us again be factual. Let us remember that all the way through life we have also done some things rather well. We have not been an uninterrupted mistake. We have not been total failures. 
we do not only find it advisable to hang our heads with a measure of repentance, but also occasionally to raise our heads with a sense of quiet dignity for things that we have done well. As we look back over a long life, or maybe look forward to a long one, we can still begin to estimate the fact that there is in us a tremendous potential for doing things well. And we will find, looking back over this situation, that our best instruction, our most reasonable advice, our most kindly and constructive deeds also make a pattern. They reveal to us, first of all, that there is a kindliness in us, even though we try desperately to hide it. We also realize that although we have been frequently exploited, there is an instinct to trust other people. Although we have been more or less perhaps cheated, we still have a basic desire to be honest. And although we criticize people until it is a scandal and a shame, there are moments when we have a very great desire to help and love other people. I knew one individual who was a handsome critic. Oh, they could take anything apart. And one day after they had taken one person to pieces pretty thoroughly and pretty unkindly, the person who was the victim of all of this tirade suddenly burst into tears. Immediately, the critic melted. All thought of criticism disappeared because of one, of course, obvious circumstance. No one wishes really to be faced with the fact that he has brought suffering to someone else. The instinct immediately was repentance. And in a very few moments, this critic was beginning to extol the virtues of the other person, trying to help them back because the critic was made uncomfortable by their tears. And he was also searching to regain his own comfort. He did not want to think of himself as a person who made others weep. So he had to get them out of it to protect his own self-esteem. Thus we observe all the way along that the individual has his moments when he does things rather well. And as he looks back over these moments, they may also make a pattern. And they will tell him the situations in which he is able to make a positive contribution. And these situations, perhaps, once he understands them, can be revitalized again. In the, in the meaning that if under certain attitudes we take a more constructive view of things, then these attitudes should be cultivated. And we can begin to find a scientific method of opening ourselves to a better level of thought and emotion. So we begin to look back, and we find almost certainly that we were our, our best when our minds were not on ourselves. When we sincerely forgot our own interests in the cause of something else that was bigger, those were our good moments. When we performed actions in situations in which there was no reward or penalty to us, such action was reasonably honest. Like blindfolded justice, we did not take sides. We therefore discover that our bad actions are tied to self-interest. Our good actions are bound to those situations in which emergency, stress, or impersonality resulted in the individual operating without the interference of his own egoism. The sick neighbor 
impelled us immediately to go over and see what we could do. And the fact that it was someone else, that our sympathy was aroused, that another person was in trouble, these attitudes bring out indications of man's basic humanity. So we can look back and we can see that there is a humanity in us, a very strong one. And we will also probably remember back to the time when these unselfish or well-intentioned uh, actions brought a measure of great self-satisfaction in a quiet, impersonal way. We felt better because we acted better. We found also a new kind of self-regard not based upon the victory of our opinions, but the fact that we had simply and instinctively done something we were proud of. So we find that going back over these patterns, they make a distinct contribution. Also, we learn in this way that sometimes we have given advice better than we knew, that under the pressure of some great need, we had more strength than we realized, and that out of a sincere desire to, ser to serve, sacrifice was no longer sacrifice, it was privilege. There were moments when these moods reached us, and there are mo moments again when they will reach us. But can we organize our thinking about these things as we organize our acceptances of other levels of values? If we can organize our own conduct a little, we will probably discover that when we were quite small and young children, we had a certain grace and charm and love of life. And as we grew older, one incident after another has limited or disillusioned this natural uh, buoyancy and natural lovableness that is in us. So as we grew older, we lost the charm of childishness. We also lost what Lao Tse calls the child heart. We lost this wonderful ability to enjoy with things. This tremendous capacity, capacity simply to rejoice in aliveness. We did not need to have expensive things to make us happy. The world was wonderful, and everything in it was adventure. And we found a constant challenge and a constant amazement and a thrill in everything that happened. Then by degrees we lost this buoyancy of spirit, and by degrees disillusionment set in upon us. But this spirit is not dead. It merely sleeps beneath the surface of pressures which we have not learned how to master. All of this direct simplicity can be restored. And it can be restored and enriched by the sober experiences of living, properly interpreted and properly related to the universal pattern of life. In the restoration of this principle of good in our own nature, there is, therefore, only a kind of obeying of a basic instinct that is deeper than our instinct to disobey. One of the reasons why this deeper instinct is not more available to us is because we have learned to live only on surfaces. We do not dare to go into ourselves. We are afraid of what we will find there. We have looked out through the windows of the senses so long that we can think of ourselves only as a sensing organism surrounded by other things which we can sense. The idea that these sensory testimonies must be taken into consciousness and by alchemy transmuted into value. 
This idea is strange to us, even though we can often accept it intellectually as true. In the release of good through ourselves, simplicity of action, directness of action, all these things become increasingly valuable. And in our associations with persons where most of our troubles arise, we have the right, the constant and unchanging right, to consider these pre people by means of these faculties that are deeper in ourselves, rather than always by surface faculties. We have a right to say to ourselves, I'm not sure that I like what you do, but I'm rather sure I would like what you are if I could find out what that is. The answer lies usually in the fact that the other person is misrepresenting himself just as we are misrepresenting ourselves. His internal has not been challenged. He has not found a way to bring forth the out, bring out that which is within himself. And when we meet him head on in an intellectual collision, or whether and when we meet him with criticism, or condemnation, or suspicion, doubt, or avarice, or we are working only from ulterior motives within ourselves, trying to influence him in some way or another. We can meet in him only his defenses. He comes out with the same qualities that we have, and these qualities lock in war and endurance becomes the deciding factor. The one who lasts the longest wins the battle, such as it is. But in the greater battle, both sides have lost. If, on the other hand, you meet this person with a certain expectation of value, without ulterior motive of your own, and without creating situations that cause suspicion in him, you may find that his defenses do not go up. You may find also that you come much nearer to him. There is nothing that makes us try to reveal ourselves as much as the sense that someone else can understand. When we know they won't understand, we do not try. There is no sense in it. So each person, by misunderstanding another, will help to lock that other person also, and will prevent the natural virtues of that person from ever appearing. Therefore, the less we think of him, the more proof we will have that he is not a desirable character. But the same defenses are occurring in him that occur in us. Now, if we have locked a situation over a period of years until everyone is psychologically muscle-bound, we are not going to solve such a situation easily, if at all. But in our general attitude toward life, living according to the good is based upon the simple formula that nothing can live or exist or be unless within that thing is the same eternal essence that is in everything else. Thus all things, regardless of their conduct in this world, are essentially good. And what we call evil, or in many cases what we abhor as a terrible misuse of power or authority, does not mean that the divine principle is absent. It merely means that energy is being miserably misused and that a life is being lived that is a complete sacrilege in relation to the energy uh, available for the purpose of achievement. For the same energy that creates the saint creates the tyrant. It is the use of this energy by the conscious dedication of life. Thus within ourselves, 
is this power of the good, which we can use either to release good or to imprison it. And in releasing it in ourselves, we release it in everything else. Whereas Plotinus again tells us that the good in each rushes forth to meet the good in all. The individual who becomes a living manifestation of value, of real value, calls value out of everything else by a wonderful, magical enchantment. Thus life becomes easier. Other people seem to change when we change. <laughs> Actually, a new perspective toward nearly every problem in life will make that problem, if not completely desirable, at least a one which we can carry with dignity and grace of spirit. By so doing, we relieve ourselves of tremendous tension and stress. Rediscover the child heart, which is forever exploring the wonder of life, forever abiding in miracles because of its own miraculous power to accept and to love and to understand. Thus our problem of releasing good simply means that the individual, instead of fighting it, allows his natural nature an opportunity. He begins perhaps by visualizing, out of experience and out of his own memories, the good that he has done, the things that could be better. If he has religious affiliation or spiritual conviction in his background, he can turn to the inspiring concepts of his faith, find that they likewise urge him to release good through himself, that through friendliness, kindliness, regard, patience, many things can be accomplished that cannot be accomplished in any other way. And that if we do release these values, we are not so likely to have ungrateful children or persons with whom we cannot get along. It is not merely that we have done a duty, that we have been true to a responsibility, perhaps grudging it all through the years, but that we have simply relaxed and allowed good to have its perfect work allowed it to bring its own joy to us and through us to others. Because in the core of ourselves, there is an energy that has no conflict, that does not need conflict. It is the mind-emotion complex that creates conflict, and in so doing deforms us, distorts us, damages the divine image in our own constitutions. If we can just let something of beauty and goodness have an opportunity to function by a resolving that wherever an emergency arises, we will be a little slower in decision, giving the full nature a chance to come out, that we shall not feel the victory of conquering others mentally, emotionally, or physically, but rather that the greatest of all achievement is not to control or direct another, but to release them, to inspire them, and to make it possible for them to be their own true selves. No person is better because he becomes like us. He is better if he becomes like the good in himself. For each has his own pattern. And while we try to impose our pattern upon him, we create rebellion. When we try to help him to create his own pattern and release it through his own consciousness, he finds in us the true friend and the true comrade. 
Everything we do, therefore, can gradually become less injurious to ourselves. Whether we recognize or realize it or not, criticism is a habit that leads to sickness. It leads also to the sickness of disillusionment. It forces the individual to live in a tired, weary, unhappy world, which he has forced upon his own nature. It constantly causes him to see the faults in others, when in reality it would be better for him to search for the good in others. Now this does not mean that searching for the good makes us gullible. We are not gullible because we see good in others. We are gullible because we want something for nothing, and that's selfishness, not gullibility. We are not imposed upon because we trust other people. We are imposed upon because of ulterior motive in ourselves. We are imposed upon because we do not use common sense. We are imposed upon because we do not ask the right questions at the right time. And we are imposed upon because we do not read the small type at the bottom of the page. We are not imposed upon simply because we seek good in others. We are imposed upon because in one way or another we, over, we overestimate the ability of the other person to practice the good. We may see the good in another person, and that person may remain selfish. But I have observed over a pretty long period of experience that when we start trusting people, they consistently become more trustworthy. And when we take the attitude of a man that his word is no good and his bond is no better, we are very apt to be dealing with a crook before we're through. We do not, however, let down all our guards and simply say that either this man is a criminal or else he is a god. We use common sense. We examine all things. We weigh them. We use good judgment, but our judgment is not the base of love or hate. If we demand from the other individual a reasonable integrity in our relationships with him, we can help him to grow. We do not help him to grow by catering uh, to his uh, dishonesty, nor do we help him to grow by branding him dishonest before we know him. We help him to grow by showing that we are willing to cooperate in an honorable way. That if he is honorable, we will be honorable. If he is not honorable, we will not be dishonorable with him. These simple values simply straighten out things. And if people come to the parting of ways on matters of honor, it is still not necessary to part hating each other or allowing all kinds of evil to cause us to seek nothing but revenge. Revenge never produced anything yet but acidosis. It is useless. All these things are useless. The problem is to have the strange, direct simplicity and honesty which comes with a substantial footing in law and life itself. <coughs> Nature Dove never caters to dishonesty, but nature criticizes nothing. Yet inevitably it moves all things to their appointed ends. The individual working with himself needs not become the critic, nor does he need to condemn anything. He needs to permit lawfulness to be born in him and move through him into operation. If he keeps the law, if his mind is relaxed, if his emotions are relaxed, he can face any emergency with the full available resource of his nature. He will then not be deceived, he will not be exploited. And if he is still not able to prevent the emergency, he then has the courage to face it and survive it. 
It all means this quietude, this integration within self, this achievement of the power to let good work. And every time we relax a little and give it a chance, good becomes more obvious. And in time, we shall become so entranced with its activities that our own personal pledge, pleasures and prejudices become meaningless. Because a prejudice is of no value of any kind. The only thing that is valuable is to know that we are working with the law. That in this law is our hope, our spiritual uh, faith, our trust, that everything we dream of, every good we plan for, depend upon law. And also that the achievement of these things depends upon our living the law. If the law is the hope, then obedience to it is the way, and the peace we seek is the end. And gradually making this a scientific, reasonable, factual statement in our own lives causes us to say, let the law work. Or as it says in the Bible, not my will but thine be done. And the moment we permit the will of the good to be done, we do not find that we drown in a sea of weakness. We find unassailable strengths, for there is only one thing in the universe that is strong, and that is the good. And there is only one kind of person in the world who is strong, and that is the person who bases his strength upon this good by finding it and serving it. All else is weakness. When we see this and understand it, we're on the way uh, to security, hope, faith, and understanding. These values without which our world cannot survive and with which all miracles of nature can in due time be perfected. Time's up. <laughs> Next Sunday morning, we have a rather interesting uh, subject for you. As you know, some years ago, about the same time as the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, a discovery was made in Chanaboskian in Egypt of a library of early Christian books. These books belonged uh, principally, but not exclusively, to the early Christian sect of the Gnosis. But in the collection are books referred to, but previously not known to exist, relating to the early development of Christian religion and philosophy. As these books are earlier than any others known except the Gospels, and as they carry back the foundations of the faith into the third and fourth century, representing the contemporary position at that time and the convictions and conflicts already uh, being intensified. They, they are an important collection. One of these is called the Gospel of Truth, and it has to do with man's eternal search for value and also the early Christian mysticism about truth and religion. So we are going to choose it as our subject for next Sunday morning. May I point out that after next Sunday, we will not be here until April 27th. In the interval, I'm making a trip north. I will be speaking, I will give a lecture in Fresno, and also a series of lectures in Portland. And those interested can secure programs on our table for friends in these two areas. We hope if you know persons who will be interested you will get a program for them, or take a program and address it to them, and we will mail it for you. Also, we have some more lectures, mimeograph lectures, of our older lecture notes, 
on the table which we think will be of interest and value to you. May I recommend rather strongly our book Self-Unfoldment in connection with this morning's activity, as we feel that it will be helpful and useful. The lecture notes that we have are from those taken some years ago, but most of the material is utterly undated, dealing with basic problems. For instance, we have lecture notes today dealing with the uh, various ductless glands of the body and their psychic contribution to our consciousness and emotional life. These lecture notes are for your consideration. Now, we hope to see you next week, and we thank you for being here, and hope that you will remember friends in Portland or Fresno and let them have programs. Thank you very much.